Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, more federal inspectors are on the way to the San Onofre nuclear power plant. Also, the battle over water rates in San Diego. The county water authority says our main supplier is being controlled by a shadow government. And this kissing couple has led to a battle over public art in San Diego. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. Joanne Farian has the night off. A team of federal investigators will visit the San Onofre nuclear power plant after some equipment failed a pressure test. The failure was in three tubes that apparently carry radioactive water to the plant's steam generators. Those generators were shut down six weeks ago after a leak was discovered in one of the tubes. Agents from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have been on site while Southern California Edison works to resolve the problem. Now, the NRC says it will send another team to review equipment design, construction, and operation at the plant north of Oceanside. A judge has postponed a decision on whether to allow the Utility Consumers Action Network to dissolve. UCAN's lawyers asked to put the consumer watchdog group into receivership while charges of financial mismanagement are resolved. The group is under federal investigation. The judge put off a decision until next week to give all sides more time to prepare. A judge has granted a request regarding San Diego Gas and Electric smart meters. UCAN wanted customers to be able to keep their old meters because of concerns about possible health risks and privacy issues. The judge proposes letting customers keep their old meters at an extra cost, $75 up front, then $10 a month after that. The Public Utilities Commission has 30 days to accept or reject the judge's decision. The battle between San Diego County Water Authority and Metropolitan Water District heated up this week and it could affect your future water bill. San Diego's water agency released hundreds of documents they say show the MWD board held private meetings and may have made decisions that affect water rates. Dennis Cushman is with the San Diego County Water Authority. Dennis, thank you for joining us. Uh, explain to us what you found in these mostly email documents from the right. MWD. Well, what we did is uh, we had we'd suspected that a group of member agencies of Metropolitan of public officials were meeting privately among themselves uh, in concert with Metropolitan's management uh, to devise policies and water rates and revenue systems at Metropolitan that disadvantaged San Diego. So last October, we sent uh, Public Records Act requests under California law, the C Public Records Act, uh, requesting documents uh, from Metropolitan and 18 of its other 25 member agencies uh, asking for documents about this group that we had heard that they formed. Uh, we had heard them call it the Anti-San Diego Coalition. And so we asked them about uh, documents around that Anti-San Diego Coalition, what little information we had at that time about it. And what we've received so far are thousands of pages of documents. And we've put together about 500 of them in this binder uh, to share not only with the Metropolitan Board of Directors, as we did earlier this week, but also with the public, so that everyone can look at what really happens behind the scenes at California's largest water district and how that disadvantages us here in San Diego. So this is about um, the LA and Orange County members and leaving out San Diego County Water Authority members from these special meetings? Yes, uh, leaders from uh, the City of Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the Municipal Water District of Orange County, and the Western Municipal Water District in Riverside County, and the West Basin Municipal Water District also in Los Angeles County. They came together as the leaders, the ringleaders of this group, if you will, and brought in a number of other member agencies, and they together can control uh, the voting outcomes on the Metropolitan Board of Directors. So that's the next question. What kind of power do they wield uh, without the uh, influence of San Diego County? Well, they, they, these 20 agencies that have been involved in this clandestine effort control 75% of the voting power on the Metropolitan Board of Directors, and they know it. They and know they have the power to pass anything on that board. And at the end of the day, what does it mean to me as a water customer? It means money. It means being overcharged by Metropolitan for our ratepayers here in San Diego County. This year, their, their rates and revenue system that these people devised and they're protecting will overcharge our ratepayers here in San Diego County $40 million this year alone. Well, that same $40 million is redistributed uh, by the Metropolitan Water District uh, to those other agencies in the form of lower payments they make to Metropolitan. 
Now, has anyone admitted to this so-called secret agency? No, the, 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 the denials have been spewing forth since Monday. Uh, we've seen a number of denials, pretty angry denials, uh, some insulting uh, language. And that's one of the reasons we put all of these documents up on our website that we created to shed light uh, uh, appropriately during Sunshine Week, hmm. a National Sunshine Week, where you shed light on what's going on really with government, with your local elected officials. And I want to get to that website in just a moment, but first let's just be fair to uh, highlight the response from the MWD. Uh, they issued this press release regarding the website we're going to talk about that you launched, mwdfacts.org. Here's what uh, the MWD had to say. It is regrettable that San Diego County Water Authority is using ratepayer money to engage in political gamesmanship and questionable tactics outside of the deliberative process where all member agencies attempt to work collaboratively to resolve differences. Mr. Cushman, your response to that? Well, I, I think, uh, to be fair, that there's a word in that statement that we do agree with, and that's deliberate. Uh, clearly, what they've been doing over the last two and a half years has been very deliberate. It's deliberately disadvantaging and discriminating against ratepayers here in San Diego County. Uh, they brag about an open and inclusive uh, process at Metropolitan. Uh, the one word that we would uh, disagree with in their statement is the word all, as in they've included all member agencies. And the records speak for themselves and they speak volumes about the secret society they created to exclude San Diego from the policy making decisions at Metropolitan. All right, we can't get into the website, but it is mwdfacts.com, mwdfacts.com. And that's where you can go, anyone can go, to get the facts and to look at the records that we released today. Right, and then the um, increase uh, on rates expected uh, to be decided April 10th, right? Yes, Metropolitan is proposing two more years of rate increases. The rate increase that they're proposing for 2013 would be a 10.6% 10 10 increase to us here in San Diego County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Southwestern College is putting a one-year hold on most of its voter-approved bond projects in the South Bay. The governing board took the action after learning $89,000 was spent on public relations. Southwestern College was ordered to repay the money from its general fund. School officials say the one-year delay will allow time to reevaluate the process and make sure the public's money is being spent properly. An investigation found incomplete record keeping and a lack of clear guidelines on how to spend the bond money approved by voters in 2008. A San Diego congressman says he's found new video of a Marine turned down for a posthumous Medal of Honor. Republican Duncan Hunter says it was taken by a cameraman during an attack in Iraq. It includes a Marine saying Sergeant Rafael Peralta pulled a grenade to his body to smother the explosion. Military investigators decided Peralta was too wounded to have consciously scooped up the grenade. Hunter wants the Navy to take another look because of eyewitness accounts, forensic reports, and this video. Well, you don't often hear about Republicans and Democrats getting along these days, but Republican Pam Slater Price has endorsed a Democrat to succeed her on the County Board of Supervisors. Dave Roberts is the lone Democrat in a field of five running for the seat. It also, it's also the first opening on the County Board of Supervisors in 16 years. KPBS reporter Allison St. John joins us from the News Center with an update. Uh, did this endorsement, Allison, come as a surprise today? Well, Duane, in some ways, yes, because there hasn't been a Democrat on the Board of Supervisors in San Diego for more than 20 years. The last time there was one was Leon Williams back in the 1980s. But in some ways, no, because uh, Pam Slater Price is one of the more moderate members of the board, and uh, there's no love lost between her and Steve Dannon, who has been the front runner uh, until now and who has been running for this seat for a couple of years, in fact, even before she declared she was going to step down. Yeah, you mentioned Steve Dannon. Who are some of the other uh, candidates in the field? Well, there is Carl Hilliard, who is the mayor of Del Mar, and then there's uh, Steve Pate, who is a transportation supervisor, and Byron Ziegler, who is a county count assistant county council. And could one of them win out right in June? Uh, it's very unlikely. It's very likely that there will be a runoff at this point now, but it looks like we'll probably have a race in November. KPBS reporter Allison St. John. Republican lawmakers in Sacramento are trying to repeal a fire protection fee on rural property owners. 
The $150 a year fee is supposed to be charged for the first time this spring. It affects about 850,000 landowners in California. Governor Jerry Brown proposed the fee last year. He says people who choose to live in areas prone to wildfires should pay more for fire protection. Democratic lawmakers joined him in approving the fee. Home sales rose significantly last month in California. Investors paid mostly cash for the lowest priced properties. San Diego tracking firm DataQuick says nearly 30,000 new and existing homes as well as condos were sold in February. That's a nearly 9% jump from a year ago. The median price for a single family home statewide was about $239,000. That's up, or rather that's down about 2% from last year. Tourism got a bit of a boost in San Diego last year. The Convention and Visitors Bureau says 31 million visitors came in 2011. That's an increase of about a million from the year before. Convis says the challenge now is to increase revenues by bringing in more tourists who stay longer and spend more money. The Unconditional Surrender Sculpture, or Kissing Statue, has been popular with tourists on San Diego's waterfront, but not so much with some members of the Port's Public Art Committee. And today, some of them surrendered in frustration. KPBS arts reporter Angela Carone was at the meeting and joins us from the News Center. Uh, this debate, Angela, is over that 25-foot tall sculpture of a sailor kissing a nurse. So what happened today? Well, Duane, two of the high-profile members of the port's public art committee resigned today in frustration and protest. They say their input and expertise is not valued or respected by the port's board of commissioners. Now, this all stems from a vote that happened last week. The public art committee, after careful consideration, voted to not accept a permanent version of the Kissing Sailor sculpture. They presented their findings to the commissioners, but the commissioners voted to accept it anyway. And I'll add that it's not just the two members who resigned who were frustrated. There was a real sense of disappointment and defeatism in that meeting today in the wake of last week's vote. And how is the Port District of San Diego responding to this? Well, the port staff who led the meeting encouraged the group to persevere. They say that this statue is politically charged and not typical of how proposals will play out in the future. Of course, some will argue that the port has a history of making decisions like this one. I think they're just hopeful that no one else will resign in the coming days and that they can regroup. KPBS arts reporter Angela Carone. There's a paradise for low-budget surfers way down south in Baja, California. But where there's a good wave, there's a battle over who gets the best access to it. That story coming up from our front terrace desk. And is classical music really good for your brain? A look at some myths and facts about the human brain in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Ray Suarez. On the next News Hour, a newsmaker interview with the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan, Ryan Crocker. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. The fabric of democracy, I think, really has worn very thin. The opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Americans have to fight for the American dream. Democracy is not what governments do, it's, it's what people do. This is how we fight back. Moyers and Company. I'm Bill Moyers. Join me Friday nights at 10 on KPBS San Diego. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Does listening to classical music or doing difficult puzzles make you smarter? Is it true we only use 10% of our brain? Those are actually two brain myths my next guest hopes to set straight. 
It's Brain Awareness Week, and UC San Diego is announcing the start of a new website called BrainFacts.org. Joining me is Professor Nick Spitzer, a neurobiologist and co-director of UC San Diego's Cavalli Institute for the Brain and Mind. Now, you are also editor-in-chief of this uh, new website, which officially launches um, in May, right? That's correct, Wayne, yes, and we're very excited about this. We think that this will be an authoritative, inviting source of, of information for the general public about all the aspects of the brain in which they're interested. Well, talk about some of uh, what you're going to offer on this website. Well, it has a topic-based architecture, which means uh, that when you go on the website, if you're a curious individual, if you're a K-12 through teacher or student, if you're a policy maker, if you're a patient or a patient advocate, you can go to the appropriate menu, pull down that menu, and right away get into uh, information that would be interesting and relevant for you. Uh, uh, and the, uh, there'll be lots of links that will allow you to uh, dig down to deeper and deeper levels of information uh, as your interest grows, we hope, and grows. Uh, and finally, at, at the bottom of these, uh, this hierarchical organization of knowledge will be references to original literature, should individuals want to go and, and, and look at this. Wow, so you can follow up and, and dig deeper and deeper yes, yes. into brain matter. A absolutely, very nice. So yes, to speak. Yes. Now, now, when we sat down here, you said something to me about uh, people have persistent views, so this may be a bit of an uphill climb, right? Well, there are a number of misconceptions that people have about the brain, uh, and uh, these are, are popular myths. Uh, the, the idea that classical music makes you smarter, as, as you mentioned, uh, is, is one of these, the, the so-called Mozart effect. Uh, I wish it were true. Uh, I, I play <laughs> classical music for my children all the time, and, and they're smart, but I'm not sure there's a connection here. Uh, rigorous studies have indicated that this is actually not the case. Uh, another m myth is that alcohol Alcohol uh, kills uh, the brain cells, that every time I drink a glass of red wine that I'm killing neurons in my brain. This also is not true. Uh, chronic drinking, heavy drinking, of course, yes, this will kill nerve cells, but uh, a, gr a glass of red wine with dinner can have very salutary effects. Now, you, you mentioned uh, some of those who might benefit from this site, so you see this as as something for the layman as well as the teacher? That's right, that's right. We really have these four different audiences. Uh, the uh, the layperson uh, and, and any interest that he or she has in understanding more about the brain, uh, patients and patient advocates, people who uh, have or individuals that they care about who have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or some other uh, neurological disorder, uh, a whole range of people uh, who uh, really want to know more about the brain and uh, the uh, website is, is put on and backed by the Society for Neuroscience. Uh, this is a big society, 42,000 members, neuroscientists like me, uh, who are working actively in the field, contributing new research findings so that uh, the, the, the public can have then access to the new information as it becomes available. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you come up with this idea? Where, where did it come It from? was a long time in gestation. Uh, uh, almost 10 years ago, one of the uh, society presidents, uh, uh, Huda Akil, very distinguished investigator, she is professor at the University of Michigan, on the back of a napkin at a dinner, she uh, wrote this out, and then, of course, years later, it's now come to fruition. We're very fortunate to have uh, funders, uh, content partners from the Kavli Foundation, the Gatsby Foundation. Uh, these uh, folks have stepped forward and provided the money to go ahead and launch the website. Uh, and so many thanks to them uh, for getting us started in this enterprise. Okay. And of course, this is Brain Awareness Week. Um, and, and, and there has uh, been quite a, an evolution as it relates to sciences and and neurology, right? Yes, uh, new yes. areas of study? L uh, many new areas of study. Uh, people understanding more about the uh, plasticity of the brain, the way the brain changes as we learn uh, and remember, or alternatively, as we forget. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, lots of interest in, in this. Uh, people are also now very actively studying consciousness. What does it mean to be conscious? Uh, uh, do other animals have consciousness? Is this, is this a general feature of the way the nervous system operates? Uh, uh, we're getting new insights into the origins of different uh, brain disorders, so there's a lot of really exponential growth in our knowledge about the brain. Professor Spitzer, this sounds uh, intriguing. Thank you for your time. Very happy to be here. And it's brainfacts.org, launches in May. That's right, and Twitter presence is already out there. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. For decades, Southern California surfers have enjoyed the relatively uncrowded waves of Baja California, Mexico, but the route to some of the best waves have been blocked in recent years by high-rise condos and private development. 
From our Fronteras desk, Jill Replogo and KPBS video journalist Katie Euphrat bring us the perfect break that's also causing an ongoing battle. I came here in 1976, found the wave, and decided it was like the best wave I've been in, in all the way down to Peru. Well, I started flying in Baja in about 1976 or 77, and I have a light plane, so I started looking for places to fly and surf. And San Juanico was one of the first places I came across that had both a, a landing strip and a really great wave. The place, as far as I was learned, is when it's on, it's as good a wave as there is in the world. These three surfers are talking about the wave at San Juanico, or Scorpion Bay, as it's more popularly known in the surf community. It might not look like much now, but in the summertime, the ride can be epic. The place is remote. From San Diego, it's about a 900-mile drive via the main paved highway, or 650 miles if you're willing to brave a long stretch of mud and salt flats. Despite the distance, in the summertime, hundreds of American surfers make the journey in four-wheel drives and makeshift campers. They spend their days riding waves that can last up to a minute and a half. That's a long ride. Most spend their nights in the campground that occupies the rocky, cactus-studded point directly above the wave. This prime piece of land has caused a nasty legal battle. It demonstrates the passion and sense of possession surfers feel for their waves. James Adkins is one side of that battle. We're, we're very selfish with our waves. I mean, we don't want to have more people. His former business associate, Reuben Andrews, is on the other side. He leases the campground land from a communal agricultural group, or ejido. Whoever ends up with that property, you know, has kind of a public responsibility to deal with it in a, in a way that I think respects the traditional uses there. Meanwhile, the ejido just wants to turn a profit. The ejido owns thousands of acres of beachfront property, and they never used it for much more than grazing until the surfers came. Pues, de qué me serviría? What good would it do me to have all these beautiful places if I don't have the capital to develop them? At stake, though, may be the most sensitive issue in the surf community, access. Atkins actually started the campground at San Juanico, but he eventually moved on to a more lucrative business, negotiating land sales between American investors and the same ejido. Atkins says he didn't necessarily want to see his semi-secret surf spot developed, but... I couldn't keep putting on the brakes when the ejido wants to sell their property. And, and if I don't do it, someone's going to step into my place. So he and a group of Southern California investors offered $3 million to buy up the campground land and build a cluster of beachfront homes at that perfect wave. But Andrews' campground lease was still in effect. That's where the war began. We tried to buy out Andrews from the beginning. He didn't want to sell out. Uh, so as in all, in all negotiations, we tried to figure out a way to, to force him to sell out. The two former business associates and the ejido have been filing suits, countersuits, and appeals against each other over the lease and the sale for the past five years. Andrews and Atkins both accuse each other of trying to block off the land. Come on, Sandy, let's go. On a recent morning, the seasoned surfer Lee of the Sea tries to play catch with his unruly German shepherd, Sandy. <laughs> Lee has been camping and surfing in Baja, California for decades, and he's lost access to many of his favorite surfing spots between Tijuana and Ensenada. I mean, access has been just about completely cut off in a lot of those places. Though he'd like young surfers to have what he had, Lee says that may not be possible. It's changing. I mean, everything changes. Like, like I've said, I said, I think I said before, you've got to kind of, if you don't change with it, you get buried. Atkins denies his group has plans to limit visiting surfers' access to the wave. But he thinks a more upscale and restricted use of the land along this prime surf spot is inevitable. In any projects all over the world, when the property gets to be a certain value, there's no way you're going to stop developers from buying that property and, and changing it from camping. The lawsuits are still ongoing, but it looks like there will be at least a few more years of camping at Scorpion Bay. 
More changes may be coming to San Juanico. They're planning to build a paved road to make the journey from San Diego about 300 miles shorter. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Hi, I'm Billy McLaughlin, and I hope you'll tune in for my concert, Starry Night with Orchestra Nova, right here on KPBS. Premieres Sunday at 8 on KPBS. Throughout its 50-year history, KPBS's news and public affairs programs have challenged conventional thinking. We're investigating issues before they reach a crisis. Our world is much more than just today's headlines, and KPBS helps all of us explore what's next so that we can take action now. Coming up on Finding Your Roots, lifelong friends Harry Connick Jr. and Brantford Marsalis embark on a search for their ancestors. It's almost impossible to believe that they were here during that time. Wow, I never saw that before. Finding Your Roots. March 25th at 8 on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Escondido City Manager has responded to allegations that the city illegally profits from its DUI checkpoints. This week, we brought you a story by a documentary filmmaker who looked into the accounting behind the city's DUI checkpoint program. John Carlos Frey says Escondido padded its expense sheets for the program to justify increased costs of its contracts with tow companies and fees charged to people for releasing their impounded cars. State law prohibits the city from charging more than their expense, expenses for administering the program. In a written statement, city manager Clay Phillips says he's ordered a review of Escondido's towing fees. He also says Escondido made every effort to ensure the towing fees reflect the city's costs. Phillips says he expects to have the review by March 29th. In the meantime, the ACLU has filed its own request for financial records related to the checkpoints. The group says a review by city staff won't be seen as independent in anyone's books. Of course, you can weigh in on the conversation by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course, you can email us. Recapping tonight's top stories, more federal inspectors are on the way to the San Onofre nuclear power plant after some equipment there failed a stress test. And a ruling on whether to allow the Utility Consumers Action Network to dissolve has been pushed back to next week. The Watchdog Group is under federal investigation amid charges of financial mismanagement. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast.